We've now seen many examples worldwide of governments introducing policies that require organisations to manage their greenhouse gas emissions. And with the Paris Agreement signalling a further international call to action, this trend is expected to continue. What will this mean for organisations? And what skills will be needed for them to survive and prosper in a low carbon economy? Some organisations will be required to directly comply with climate policy by buying ETS allowances or by meeting a legislative environmental target. Other organisations won't have to comply but will instead be impacted indirectly. For example, when liable companies pass on the additional cost of carbon in the form of increased electricity and fuel prices. Belinda Wade is an expert in best practice carbon and energy management at the University of Queensland. She joins us today to explain a few of the essential skills that you will need to manage your organisation in the low carbon economy. Impacted organisations will experience both risks and opportunities that dependent on the management choices may affect their profitability and potential competitive advantage. So whether or not your organisation is directly covered by a climate policy, carbon management skills are essential for the emerging low carbon economy. Now there are a number of common skills that you can use to manage these risks and opportunities. These skills are part of a process called the carbon management cycle. That is, the logical steps an organisation should take to manage its emissions and potential compliance obligations. Broadly, the carbon management process involves measuring, strategising, managing, reporting and finally reviewing your carbon footprint and its potential impact on your organisation. The first step is measuring the amount of greenhouse gases emitted by an organisation. This process is called carbon footprinting and is perhaps the most important skill in carbon management. After all, you can't manage what you have not measured. You'll learn more about carbon footprinting in part three of the course, where you'll actually conduct a carbon footprint for a TASLAN organisation. The second step in the carbon management cycle is strategising. This involves determining if your organisation has a compliance liability or voluntary obligation to reduce or report its carbon footprint. Once your organisation's obligations have been identified, you will have an important decision to make. Will your organisation merely comply with the minimum requirements or will it go further and look to strategically decarbonise its operation? For example, investing in low emissions assets for the long term. Regardless of the decision you make, setting performance targets is a key element of any carbon management strategy. For example, your organisation might set a goal to reduce its emissions by 20% in three years' time. Once your organisation knows its carbon footprint, has determined its long-term strategy and set reduction targets, it's time for the third step, managing. Depending on your organisation's targets and obligations, this may involve buying ETS allowances or offsets and reducing its carbon footprint through internal abatement measures. There are many possibilities within an organisation that can contribute to emission reductions. Replacing inefficient lighting, installing a wind turbine, educating and training staff to change their energy consumption habits, or switching to low emission fuels such as biodiesel. Therefore, carbon management requires the critical skills of identifying, analysing, ranking and implementing these internal abatement options. To lower the organisation's carbon footprint, You'll learn more about these skills in part four through a fun interactive exercise on marginal abatement cost curves. The fourth step in the carbon management cycle is reporting. This can include mandatory reporting under specific government policies and voluntary communication to internal and external stakeholders. For example, your organisation may wish to report emission reduction achievements to its staff to keep them engaged with internal abatement initiatives. Effective carbon management is an iterative process. So, lastly, 
the cycle is connected by the final step of reviewing your carbon management performance and revising your strategy for the next cycle. As we've seen from case studies around the world, government policy responses to climate change vary greatly. But whether you're a large company in an emissions trading scheme or a small non-government organisation striving for market leadership, it's clear that carbon management skills will become increasingly valuable. Make sure you stick around for part five of the course where we'll tie all these carbon management skills together in a special risks and opportunities game.